process. Uh, this isn't going to be a more, it's going to be more of a why and not a how to. Um, we're not going to go through step by step because that would take uh, probably weeks, maybe months. All right. So just to kind of review and catch everyone up, um, what data do we actually collect at the beam? Um, so on the right over here, let me see if I can bring up my pointer. Um, here is the actual uh, setup. At um, I always get these two confused. Um, the yellow Big Bird, I think, is at AMX. Might be at FMX. Um, but that's the robot, and right over here is where we mount the crystal, and this is the cryo where the crystals are held. And then I don't have it in this picture, but um, in this picture you can see back here is the actual detector. Um, so normally what happens is we load up the crystals, we put them on uh, <clears throat> that little goniometer, which kind of rotates the crystal, um, and then the x-rays will come out of here, and then the diffraction pattern will be collected by this machine right here. All right, um, and what it's really collecting is just basically a picture, um, and it's kind of the equivalent of like when you go to the X, uh, when you go to the dentist, you all probably got dental X-rays. Um, I think, you know, probably only the teachers remember they actually used to stick the film in your teeth um, and yep. shoot your head with X-rays, and then they actually would take the film out of your teeth and bring it in the back and blow it up and show you like 20, 30 minutes later. Um, that's exactly what they used to do back in protein crystallography. They would load up actual pieces of film and get image by image by hand. Um, now everything's digital, so this is a digital detector and it collects, um, literally can collect thousands of images pretty rapidly. All right, Let's just go to the next slide. Um, so this is a typical diffraction pattern. Um, and this is, you know, your would be your first set of data, I guess you could say. Um, normally when we're at the beam, uh, we perform either what's, depending on what beam you're on, you, you'll hear them say, okay, we're gonna screen or we're gonna raster. Uh, NYX, we do screens where basically we just shoot the, uh, the crystal three quick times just to see if there's any dots showing up. You know, is there a crystal there? Uh, and is that crystal actually diffracting? And if it is diffracting, does it look diffract like a protein or is it a salt crystal or is there lots of ice? Uh, AMX, FMX, they're a little bit more high tech. We'll do something called a raster where basically we just kind of take snapshots of an entire area to kind of figure out where the crystal is and which parts of the crystal maybe are, 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 are diffracting better. Uh, and then if things look good, what we'll do is we'll actually set up what's called the collection. Uh, and that's basically just a set of pictures. So again, depending on which one you're, which beam line you're working at, NYX, generally we just basically point the X-ray at the middle of the crystal. Um, and then we rotate the crystal either 180 or 360 degrees. And each uh, fraction of a degree, we're taking a picture. Um, I think NYX, most of the time we do like three pictures per image. So you're getting like almost 900, maybe even over 900 images of that crystal. Uh, FMX, AMX, a lot of times we'll do something called the vector. Um, just rotating it there, they call that a standard. Uh, but when you're at AMX or FMX, they might do something called the vector, which is where you actually rotate the crystal, but move it so that you're not shooting the same spot in the crystal um, all the time. And that just kind of enables you to actually use a higher strength X-ray without burning out the crystal quicker. So uh, you're still rotating the crystal, but you're also moving it along a line so that you actually don't fry the crystal um, as you shoot the same spot over and over again. All right, so um, you'll get a collection, and I actually have a quick video. I don't, don't know if it's going to play. I'm going to give it a shot to give you an idea of what a, co a collection looks like. Um, Just look, and this is at NYX. Um, so yeah. this is after he's collected it, and you could see over here uh, in this upper left-hand corner. Um, he, these are all the images. And what Kevin's going to do is he's going to hit play. And here's your diffraction data. And you can see he's scrolling through all the images. And you can see all these dots moving. So basically, it's kind of like a flip look almost of, um, I think he probably has something like 900 images here, of the same crystal being shot from multiple angles. Basically, the crystal is being rotated 360 degrees. And we have the machine set to shoot every third of a degree. Um, so we're collecting 900 pictures. and like. Mr. Pinto say you're basically seeing it from every single angle. All right, and you're collecting all these images. 
just going to X out of that. Um, there you go. All right, so what's next? How do we go from those dots to a model? And this is a 3D model that we want to make. Um, going from here to here is going to require several, several different steps of data manipulation with lots of different software tools. Um, and at first, it can kind of seem intimidating, but um, it's definitely worth learning how to use the software. And luckily for us, we have lots of people that work with us. And some of the software has actually become quite automated. Uh, because back in the day, basically, this was all done. Not only was the crystal set up and shot by hand uh, and moved by hand and new film was loaded by hand, uh, but the actual data was manipulated by hand. Um, and the whole basis of diffraction comes back to this Bragg's law, <clears throat> which basically says that you can figure out where a um, an atom or an electron was based on the x-rays coming in and um, where they show so here's your x-rays coming in one two three so there's an x-ray and you can see that it hit the atom and was deflected or diffracted off and then this one two three prime is going to be where it is on the 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 x-ray film or the detector um, so you're using a lot of math in this formula bragg's law to kind of trace back the detector to where the atom was and they do this for each picture and you can imagine each dot each picture uh, but eventually it allows you to trace back where each electron or atom was um, luckily for us we don't have to do that um, we have a bunch of software tools that actually do most of that processing for us automatically um, and the program we you'll first be introduced to is called ccp4 uh, CCP4i. There's cup. There's two different versions. There's like a Windows version and a uh, more of a Python, I guess, based version. Um, and basically, the point of this program, just a, a general overview, is it has a bunch of tools that can turn those dots into um, an electron density map. And I'll show you what that is in a minute. Um, but you'll hear words like reduction, scaling, phasing. So all these little steps are turning the dots into that electron density map. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different programs in there. And which ones you use really depends on um, the data you have, the, the way it was saved, the beam line, um, and a whole bunch of other conditions. Um, but luckily for us, um, we work at some pretty specialized beam lines. Um, FMX and MMX are probably the premier beam lines for protein crystallography in the world right now. Um, and they have a lot of computers. And a lot of that data is going to be auto processed for us. So both of these beam lines are highly automated um, and both come with a program called FastDP. As long as you check the box, it'll take your data and <clears throat> run a lot of what you would do normally in CCP4 and actually output your, your first data map. Um, and within usually three to four minutes, actually, when we're at the beam and everything's working well, You'll get a readout on the resolution of your crystal. You'll get a reading on uh, the resolution range, R merge, which is kind of an indication of how well your model is fitting, uh, completeness, how much of the crystal you actually were able to capture, uh, some other indications here, your space group, which is the type of crystal. So it does a lot and measures the size of the crystal and the angles. So it does a lot of the work really, really quickly. All right, and that's AMF and FMX. Um, and what it what is output is something called an MTZ file, and you'll commonly hear us call that the data, or sometimes we refer to that as the map. And basically, that's your electron density. That's that's where the electrons were when you shot the crystal. Um, at NYX, it's not as automated, um, but luckily for us, we have Kevin, and he's just a really nice guy. So he will probably process the data for us. Um, we've seen it done once or twice, and it looked pretty intense, right, Rob? <laughs> it's kind of scary. And even yeah. Vivian was questioning <laughs> some of the steps because, yeah. again, she hasn't done it in a long time. So automation is key. Um, but what you'll get is you'll get an MTZ file. All right, so the, an MTZ file, basically, when you put it into the next program I'm going to show you is, is this, okay? It looks like a, a blue scaffolding, and that basically is – a representation of where the electron density is. So they trace back those dots to where um, they were in the crystal, and then they generate this um, this map, basically, 
of where your electron density is, okay? Um, and it does need a little bit more post-processing sometimes after it comes off of the beam line. Uh, and so there are a few more tools sometimes we tweak uh, the data with in CC before I, but we'll definitely introduce you to that as we go along. All right. Um, so that's step one, getting your, your map. All right. Uh, step two is then we usually go back to, or used to back, go back to CCP4 and then run a bunch of programs like, uh, let's see if I remember, because it's been a while since I did it. Uh, things like Pointless and Truncate and RefMac mm -hmm. and Free Your Flag. And there's a whole bunch of little programs that we would set up and run. And that would actually basically match our model to our map. Um, so if I go back a step, so here's where the density is. And then what we go back to is try to overlay what we know about the protein model to match it up. I mean, I don't know if you could see this, but this kind of looks like, almost looks like a helix. So what CCP4 will try to do is fit what's known about um, the model and try to match it up with what the data is saying or what the data is showing. Uh, the great thing that we've been using lately at um, AMX and MathMX is they actually have another program that actually automates that as well. So there's FastDP that will kind of process, automatically process your data. And then there's Dimple, which will actually automatically try to match your map to your model. Okay. Um, this is commonly used when you have ligands. So when you're trying to find ligands, you kind of already know what the structure is. So if you give it the, the PDB file, for the structure without the ligand, it kind of just knows that, okay, I'll overlay that and then I'll look for anything that is out of the ordinary. All right, and both of those actually are done at AMF and FMX automatically. It's built into the, the, the software there at the beam. Um, but if you're at NYX, there's just, you know, one, one set of tools in CC before you just click dimple, you add your MTZ file, you add your P PDB file and it will do it automatically. Um, so that's not so intimidating. And basically what you're going to get as an output is now you have your electron density, which is in blue. Um, actually, sometimes when you do it, it turns to purple. Uh, and then you have your model, which is, are these stick drawings laid over it. All right. So now you have the data, which is the blue or purple electron density. <clears throat> and you have your model, which is the amino acid structure overlaid along that um, that data. All right. And it depends, again, what kind of experiment you're doing. This one happened to be a ligand experiment. Um, so if you notice down here, there's some data, there's some electron density showing up. Uh, and it's been highlighted in green because there's no model for it. Um, there's no, the computer can't figure out a way to overlay the protein. And the reason being there, that isn't actually the protein. That is the ligand that we're, they were trying to bind. Um, so they have to go back and see if that's, you know, if that structure actually fits, that data fits what they think the ligand looks like. All right, so that's, um, all that is actually done in a program called Coop. So it's a 3D modeling software, um, freeware, anyone could download it. Um, this is a little logo, and this is what you're gonna use to try to build your, your 3D model. Uh, and basically, there's lots of different tools in Coot, but <clears throat> for the most part, we do two things. Um, we try to get our model to match our data. So in this case, you can kind of see over here, here's our data, that purple like scaffolding, and then this the protein model is right there. And you can see over here, this is kind of sticking out. So the that doesn't match the data. So what you do is you, what they call refinement, and there's a whole host of tools over here that enable you to, within the laws of chemistry and physics, manipulate those amino acids to try to get them to fit the data. Um, and in this case, this is a project my students were working on last year. The model um, obviously is not fitting very well. Um, and most likely that's because this is the ligand and what it caused is the model to shift, um, or I should say the data to shift, but now we have to make the model shift to fit that, that, that adjustment. So when they're gonna work on putting in the ligand here and then figuring out how these amino acids that were probably supposed to be here are now have been moved. All right, so that's what they mean by refinement. Um, and usually the program actually has, you know, a set of tools that within, again, the rules of chemistry and physics allow you to kind of manipulate these, these amino acids. And finally, what it also will do is uh, we also use CUT for validation. So like I said, there are certain rules 
um, that dictate how, you know, an amino acid behaves and how it can bend um, and the different types of shapes it can take. And we go back and we use these validation tools to try to see if the amino acids that we moved and adjust are actually fitting the model, the, or I should say the data better or not. Um, so there's different types of data me uh, validation measurements, but basically what happens is you you run them and then you'll see these red or, or orange peaks. And the red's kind of like, you know, that's, that's a warning that's probably not fitting too well. Maybe you need to go back there and adjust it and try to get it to look more orange or green. Um, <clears throat> So this is a density fit analysis over here. Uh, this is a Ramachandran and basically kind of overview, you see these outliers and you're gonna click on these and try to figure out you know, what's wrong with them and try to make them fit better by using this model, these model refinement tools. And again, we go through this uh, and as you get your data, uh, you'll, you'll take separate little courses on how to do that. All right, and uh, if it all works out at the end, hopefully you'll have a structure. Um, that you can publish to the PDB um, or share in a paper or something like that. And that's pretty much what I have. Again, just a quick <clears throat> overview. Um, but just as you learn about the programs, this way you'll at least know what they're used for. Any questions? I just, I just want to comment. If you can go back, John, like, yeah, right to there. This is the part that my students last year absolutely loved um, because it was almost like art where they had to go and make that model fit that data. And they went through so many iterations of it and it became almost like a little competition for themselves where they were like, well, how close can I get this? How can I get this? How perfect can I get this to fit? Um, and they really spent a lot of time on it. And it's something that, when you start doing it, you start kind of going down like a rabbit hole and all of a sudden like two hours goes by and you're like, wow, I just spent two hours doing this. This is incredible. Um, it looks very complicated and it, it is to an extent, but what happens is you start using the same tools again and again. And so you become very familiar very quickly with the tools that you need to make this work and to adjust the structure. Um, and to me, this is actually a lot of fun. I was petrified of using this program about a year and a half ago. And then one night I sat down on the couch in my den and I spent about two, three hours going through it step by step and figured it out. And now I feel pretty comfortable with it. Um, and we actually have videos that we made to show everyone how to use this. So when the time comes, um, my students will be learning this and all the other students in the other schools will be learning it. Um, and we're going to use those videos uh, because that seems to really help. Uh, you can stop and start any way you wanted, but it's a really cool program to use because you're really sitting there creating a structure that has never been seen before. Um, and what's really neat is at the end of this, you now have a new structure uh, based upon data that you collected that is unique and is potentially something that can go into the protein data bank where other scientists can then use that um, for drug design and drug development or for understanding the mechanics of diseases a little bit better. Um, and that's what the PDB is for, is so that we can share the information. Um, and so that's the next piece that we're going to look at. And uh, Ms. Mackey's going to take over that piece and explain a little bit about the next steps of what the Protein Data Bank is all about. Okay. Theoretically, yes, I am. Let's... <laughs> Let's share. Let's see if experimentally my you entire are. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, all right. Let's let's yeah. we're gonna go with the sharing the entire screen. I'm gonna right. click on that. We're gonna do that. And I'm gonna pull up I have multiple now what's going on? Multiple there we go. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Hold on a second because my computer keeps freezing. And all right, we good? Yep, it's coming up now. All right, where? Yeah, except it didn't come up. Ooh, I don't see my. I don't see my PowerPoint. Maybe you guys do. No, I don't. No, I did for a second. Right. Oh, yeah. Now I okay. see. Okay. So. And now it's frozen. Ah! <laughs> Gotta love technology when it works. Yeah, when it works, right? Okay, let's try that. See, now it's freezing okay. again and not letting me 
do the uh, presentation. I got to present. All right. Oh, there we go. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's working. So I'm just, I'm not exiting out of it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Troubleshooting 101. Yeah. Okay. So yes, this is, this is the PDB, the protein data bank. And yep. I'm going to say this, um, what I do when I make a presentation is I lay out everything slide by slide, um, just to create a non video record of what we did so that if anybody wanted to come back later and check it, they can just look at the still images and not go through the video. But the video, obviously, since we're recording this, will always be available to everybody. Correct. Um, so the protein data bank is a collection of all the known protein structures that have been resolved so far. And um, each entry has more information than you could ever want to know about each protein. You've got your unique four character code, the name of the protein, the organism that it was isolated from, the amino acid sequence, the gene sequence um, that, that, that led to that amino acid sequence, the conditions under which the experiment was run, any ligands that might have been involved or what variant it might be. But you've got links to the published paper. You've got links to the actual data, I think. There's all sorts of, of things. There's a 3D visual of the molecule. It's a very, very deep, rich website. That being said, it is also very user-friendly. Um, after what Mr. Halloran just went through, some of my students, some of your, some of the students here, maybe you guys are all excited about CCP4 and COOT. Um, I'm still in the intimidated phase because I haven't isolated my protein yet and my, pro my protein hasn't crystallized. So I haven't had to go through the steps. I've gone through training a couple of times, but until you sit down and really work with it, those two programs are something you have to learn. The protein data bank, bank is not something you have to learn. It's something that you can click around and it will happily um, tell you everything you need to know. So um, here's the homepage. And um, the actual website is rcsb.org. My advice is to make yourself an account so that you can save um, your searches. Um, let's start at the very top of the page. You've got all of these tabs. And when you click on them, don't be afraid to click on any of them because every single one of them starts with an overview of what the tab does and uh, you know, lots of information about how to work that particular tab. In the future, um, with any luck and some people in the group have already done it, you may deposit or you may need the visualize tab. These are things that are going to um, come up later on, but for now we're going to start with the search tab. If you click on search, you get a bunch of different options. Turns out you can't screenshot them um, for whatever reason. As soon as you move away, your cursor away, it disappears. So I couldn't get pictures of it. So I stole these from a video on YouTube that's linked at the end of the presentation about how to navigate the thing. So you're doing your basic search, stole this from somebody, um, and th this white box up here is where you'll search for, um, if you know the name of the protein or maybe even the organism, you can try, I mean, if you put in an organism, you might wind up with thousands of results. Um, anything you have that you're looking, at, that you're interested in, you can put it in here. And What'll come up once you get a result, for example, is here's one you, once you've landed on one specific protein. Um, this protein is a human protein, apparently. And it starts with its unique name, the, the number, the actual full name of the protein, um, the classification of it. So um, kind of a, a generalized uh, description of what it does, I guess, is the best way to explain that. But... Um, if you're interested in more, you can click on it and find out the organism where they got the protein from, the date it was deposited into the database, um, how it was determined, how the structure was determined, and to what resolution it was determined. And that's actually very important information because there are um, some proteins that may, they've got a structure, but maybe it was deposited a long time ago and the resolution isn't so good. Um, you keep scrolling down the page and there's much more to be had. You've got the published articles down there along with the authors. Um, and we can scroll past this point and get even more information. But I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to go back to these tabs that are up at the top. 
um, because there's a lot of information here you can get. So for example, you can look at the versions. And if you click on this tab, it'll show you every edit that was made to this entry in time and in history. Um, you can look at the 3D view, which um, looks something like what you're, you know, what, what you're going to get if you're successfully um, resolve your issue, uh, your molecule with Coot. Um, it's a little bit simplified. It's a little bit easier to navigate. Um, oh, you know what? This when I all of these presentations that I have open at the bottom. I also had a tab um, that looked into the um, the tab. Let me go back the experiment tab, which isn't here right now. And the experiment tab will tell you exactly under what conditions this protein was resolved under. And that's a really good place to start. If you are working with a protein that's already resolved, but you want, you're, you're trying to add a ligand to it, you can um, start with the experiment to get exactly what you need. Of course, you could also check the published paper and that would tell you it too. Um, so at the very top of the main page, again, I wanna call everybody's attention to this tab, the learn tab which is like my favorite tab at this point in my process, because when you click on it, you get all of these different things that you can, you can look at that will um, walk you through just about anything you want. And one of the best ones there is the molecule of the month. Um, and the molecule of the month is, is this great thing where they, they basically help you understand the generally protein science. And it's, it's fabulous, love it. Um, so depositing to the PDB and publishing a paper are the goals of this project. Um, and there's lots of different reasons a pro protein may need to be deposited. Some proteins may have had their structures determined ever. They may, we don't know what they look like at all. Some have, but there's the different variants. Um, Others were a while ago, but they've been, the resolution isn't too good. We can, you can improve on that. And then you've got the ligands, where once you put a ligand in with a protein, as you saw in Mr. Halloran's presentation, things change and the structure suddenly changes. And so you get a whole new structure. The active site can be identified and that then can lead to um, more information that's val valuable for things like drug um, development. So there's lots of reasons to publish. And um, that means there's lots and lots of work to be done. So Spark students, it's been said before, have already deposited two, and I believe we're on the verge of depositing a third. Mm -hmm. And the first one is one where actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this presentation and, and walk us through the PDB with this one, MTHFR. I am not gonna say um, like methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, how about that? It's PDB um, ID number is 6PEY. And um, from what I gathered from researching it a little bit, it's an enzyme that converts homocysteine to methionine. And um, that's a really vital pathway for so much in biology. Methionine is used in the creation of just about every single protein. So if you have a methionine deficiency, you're going to have a problem with all sorts of pathways and you're going to wind up with too, homo, too much homocysteine and that leads to circulatory system disorders. So this, this uh, little tiny protein has massive cascading effects, which is wonderful to have identified and, um, and resolved. And then the TRMD, um, tRNA guanine N1 methyltransferase is um, the second one and that's its PDB identifier there, 6-UEV, but I don't know enough to talk about it, so I was kind of hoping Mr. Bolin would take care of that for me. Sure. Want to just give a few words? Sure. Yeah, this is a protein that basically is involved in transferring a methyl group uh, to a tRNA, and what that does is allows the tRNA uh, to bind to the anticodon. If any of you are familiar with protein synthesis, you know that mRNA contains the information that codes for protein. A ribosome reads the mRNA and it puts tRNAs in the right order. But what's important is that the first tRNA matches up with that first codon. And so by putting a methyl group on that first tRNA, it ensures that it's going to pair up correctly. Otherwise, you get what's called a frame shift mutation, and then your protein basically is gibberish after that, and you don't create the proper protein. So 
This is a protein that's found in bacteria, um, and it's actually become a major target um, because only bacteria seem to have this protein. So if we can find a drug that binds to this protein, we can use it to affect bacteria, and it would not harm any human cells in theory. So it's a real exciting area of research. And in the last couple of years, there's been a tremendous push um, of other scientists to publish and get structures of all these different uh, TRMDs from different species. So the one that we have actually came from the bacteria Anaplasma phagocytophilum, which causes anaplasmosis, which is the second most common tick-borne disease uh, in the United States. Okay, so that's my two cents on that. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. And I've got all these windows up here and I don't know where and I'm, uh, whatever. So what we're going right. to do now is going to take a look at the actual website. And when you get there, um, I'm going to put in just to, to start from the very beginning. Let's say you wanted to find out you let's say you wanted to find about more, find out more about TRMDs here up here is where you would put that in. But because I practice it with MTHFR, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> And so when you type that in, if you look, it's it's saying one of one to 14 of 14 different structures. I think when I looked at TRMD, there were 147 structures. Mm -hmm. So I stick, I'm sticking yeah. with MTHFR because it's a little bit more manageable for me. Um, and so if you scroll down, there's a, there's a whole lot of things to pick from, but I'm gonna look at the one that this group actually did. And it's this one here. So when you click onto it, it brings you to the home page of this protein. And I want to point out that these names here are all students at not Mr. Boland, right? Not not Ms. Garland right. or Mr. Halloran, but we've got students here, which is fabulous. Yeah, the, the first uh, so the you've first got three students. Yep. Um, everything that we, right now they don't have a paper published, but I, I understand that that's coming also. So if you keep scrolling down, so much to look at, so much to find. Um, and obviously the more you are exposed to this and the more work you do, the more comfortable you'll get with navigating this. So, um, if we go to the experiment, it was a vapor diffusion hanging drop. And if you remember from my plate presentation, do you understand the difference between a hanging drop and a sitting drop? And, um, the solvent content, I don't myself understand what that number means, but maybe it means something. And other ones that I've looked at, here's where that that um, mother liquor precipitant formula would be. And I'm not sure what this means, but maybe other people who are better with proteins do know what that means. Anybody want to chime in with that? Okay. Yeah, so I'm, not sure, I'm not sure why view. they don't have the... The uh, we have we know what their solvent was. I don't know why it's not in mm -hmm. there, but I know for the the number must mean something. Yeah, we'll yeah. find out. <laughs> so I clicked on three D view. Right, right. So I clicked on three D view, and um, this is like so. This is again kind of what they um, the finished product of Coot will give you, and um, you've got all sorts of options here for um, looking at the, the 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 actual molecule changing the shape the 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 structure the way you see it, changing the different colors, um, looking at the, at the, the, how close it goes, you move it around. There's all sorts of details for this. And at the bottom of my presentation, I actually have a link to a second YouTube video that goes deeper into all the different things that you can click on here and find out about. Um, but basically from your, as a student, from your perspective, um, finding all of this, why can't I, there we go. Finding all of this out is, it's just a wealth of information. It just never goes away. So um, again, if we go to, up to the beginning here, <clears throat> each one of these tabs has all sorts of resources and things you can understand. Again, I like the, the learn tab, but <laughs> you gotta click on something. So if we go to, browsing all the resources in the learn tab. There's just so much here for anybody who's feeling a little overwhelmed or a little like this is an awful lot to take in. You can take it one step at a time in here. There's even, I believe,
for people who are involved with it, a Science Olympiad thing, because one of the events in Science Olympiad is protein modeling. Um, so much going on. I think that's all for me. Does anybody have any questions? It's definitely a lot to take in, <laughs> no doubt. Um, and as we go through next week, uh, the students next week are going to use the PDB. So you're actually going to do some work with the PDB to become familiar with it. Because that, that's really the first place we go to find out about proteins and their conditions, um, what's been deposited already. You know, one of the things we don't want to do is say, hey, we have this protein, let's go and work on its structure. And then we go and work on it and forget that there are like 12 structures deposited already. And we're simply, you know, just repeating something that was done already. You want to make sure that if it was deposited, what was its resolution? Was it a good resolution? Like Ms. Mackey said, um, some stuff was done a long time ago um, in the 80s. And we have much better equipment now that can get us much better uh, resolution, much better results. So it's really our best friend, the PDB. It really does become our best friend, um, especially when we're trying to look up different uh, experiments and we're trying to find papers. Um, one of the things we need to do, which we'll be moving towards in the fall, is doing literature searches. And the best place to get literature on proteins is from the protein data bank, where we have all those papers that were written about all those different structures. Um, and so that's where we go to get the information so we can get a better understanding of what other scientists did and how they conducted their experiments. All right. Any other comments from any of the teachers want to chime in on anything? I think we're good. All right. So last thing I want to just remind students of is, um, and I was reminded to uh, just go over this one more time is this the student introduction introduction slides. Um, some of you may have made your own slide up on your on a separate uh, Google slide because you weren't able to get access to it. So I opened it up so that everybody has access to the link. Um, and just to show you real quick, if you've already done a, um, actually, let me just share my whole window, my whole screen. If you've already done your slide, you can just simply copy and paste it into the Google slide. So if you're not sure how to do that, I'm going to show you real quick. You know, here's, I see a couple of people already started putting them in. So let's say you want to insert a slide here. You can go to your presentation that you started to make your own slide in. Um, and what you can just do is simply copy. Uh, and then I'm going to just paste it right in. Let's let me do this thing. There we go. And it goes right in. And I can either match the style or keep the original. I'm going to keep the original um, just so it stays the way it is. And that's it. So you could just copy and paste the whole slide right into it. Okay. And again, all you're going to do is just go right to the original slide that you made, right click on it, copy, and then just go over here and paste. Um, and if you have the copy paste set up already in Google, I don't have it, so I just I just did the, the keyboard controls for it, and that's it. And it copies it faithfully, exactly the way you had it. And if you don't want it in there, you can just delete. So, Okay, so that's how you can do that, just so that everybody uh, can see um, how that works. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, everyone have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday morning at 10 a.m. And again, on Monday, what we're going to do is have the students do a uh, little introductory presentations the first 20 minutes or so. And then we're going to have you do a PDB scavenger hunt so that you can become very familiar with the uh, PDB. So that's it, students. Have a great weekend. Hopefully, it's starting to brighten up a little bit out there. I think it's going to dry out. It's getting windy. Um, but I think we might have a good afternoon with some sun. So have a great weekend. And uh, we'll see everybody on uh, Monday. Have your weekend. Bye. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Thank you, you too. Thank well, you, care, everybody. I'll see you guys at 11.15 and I'll Google Meet, okay? Just a reminder.